Welcome everybody to our new um, cause today. We're now up to cause 32, having started in June and filled up every week very quickly. We're now actually booking into September and October. And in fact, later on, I'm going to ask you all a question because all the high holidays are in September. And we're wondering, we can't have, they're, they're on Tuesdays, so we can't have Tuesdays. Do you want us to have a complete break or would you like us to arrange some other sort of meeting on another day during September? So that's a question that we'll ask you later on because today and right now, it's my pleasure to introduce you all again to Professor Jehoash Hirschberg, a wonderful person who's been a mainstay of congresses and conferences all over the world for many, many years. And a dear friend is now Emeritus Professor at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And his major fields have been uh, opera and Israeli art music. And today he's brought along Dr. Irit Youngerman, who is a research and teaching fellow of the University of Haifa. And they're going to talk to us about beginnings of, of music in, in uh, Palestine, in Israel's formative years, and in particular, a melody that doesn't exist anymore. Hanoch Jacobi's Mutatio, 1975, of the negation of exile in Israel's formative years. No doubt they will explain much more when they go. So I'm going to hand over now to Yehoash Hirschberg to start the session. Thank you. Oh, we have to unmute yourself now, Yehoash. Sorry, you have to unmute now. <clears throat> because we muted everybody, so <clears throat> just you, yeah, that's yeah, it. Do you, so yeah, do you but, it now? Yes. Yes, and you see me as well, I think. Yes, yes. Okay. So I'm glad to be back here. We have been, I have been in touch with this conversations on Zoom, I think, since it started, and since the wonderful conference in London. And uh, we are still expecting the book of the conference. This will take forever, apparently. But at least we meet all the time. And I'm glad to introduce Irit Jungerman, who has been my doctoral student, one of my best doctoral students, and a wonderful scholar of early Israeli music. And uh, actually she will present the lecture today. She has been studying the music of uh, Hanoch Heinrich Jacobi, one of the founders of Israeli music, a wonderful composer and violinist. I knew him personally, in fact, I even had some violin lessons with him. He has been a mostly viola player at the Israeli String Quartet. And as a composer, he had a very clear concept of what Israeli music should be. And I can say that one of the things which characterized him, that he was the, he opposed the decaphonic music completely on principle. He told me once, I think more than, more than once, that the world is based on the gravitation, the law of gravitation, and music must have a tonic. And this was, of course, the opposite of the view of the great Yosef Tal. And now we'll hear about a very important and yet forgotten piece by Hanoch Yaakovi, Mutatio. So I will hand in the lecture to Irit, please.
Yes, so, um, good evening, morning, and wherever you are. Um, and thank you for having me. It's great to be here on Cause 32. Um, the piece uh, I will talk about, Mutatio by Fanopia Kobi, is actually uh, not, not such an early piece. It's from the uh, 1970s. Um, and, uh, but I will focus on this piece because it's, it's kind of the meeting point of uh, many different things. And I would like to start by, uh, by start with the meeting point of two, two different uh, musical works. So I will play a little bit of both. Uh, let me just share the screen. Okay, and I also I'd like to mention that uh, I put some links in the chat, uh, both to musical works that I speak of and also uh, a little handout with some of the examples are, are there, available there. Um, okay, so the first one is several musical uh, versions. This one is associated with the uh, Baghdad Jews. Uh, the second piece is the uh, Mutatio by Jacobi, which is uh, my focus here. And I'll play a little bit from it. We'll, we'll hear more of the piece uh, towards the end of the presentation. Through this piece, Mutatio, and its sources in the Piyut, 
I would like to tell two different yet related stories. First, the story of Jacobi, uh, the composer, uh, which is to a certain extent the story of the composers who laid the foundations to Israeli art music and who were all immigrants. The second is the story of the sources of Mutatio, or how the piyut of the Jewish Iraqi origin found its way into the symphonic piece. Likewise, this is not just a private case, but a lens to a broader cultural environment, its ideologies and myths. Moreover, the path of the piyut into the composition reveals a surprisingly organized system directed at the creation of a national repertoire of art music and as an ultimate goal, a national musical idiom. These two stories are the first and second parts of my uh, presentation. And in the third part, we'll look at the piece itself. I was born in a town that doesn't exist anymore. These are the words with which Jacobi chose to begin his life story. Jacobi was born in the Prussian city Königsberg, which indeed became in 1945, the Russian city Kaliningrad. At 18, he moved to Berlin, where he studied at the Hochschule for Musik as Paul Hindemith's composition student. At Hindemith's suggestion, he switched from violin to viola and later became a violist member in the relatively new Frankfurt Radio Orchestra. In 1933, he was dismissed from this position as a Jew, fled to Istanbul where he failed to resettle and then to Palestine in 1934, joining the staff of the newly founded Palestine Conservatory in Jerusalem. Jacobi is interesting because he belonged to those immigrants who found adjustment difficult, despite the fact that he was a young man at the time, still in the beginning of his career. His attachment to Paul Hindemi is very evident in his musical works, as well as in his various statements and interviews, and in his correspondence with his teacher, which continued until close to Hindemith's death in 1963. Mutatio marks the end of a very long process of adjustment uh, through which at times Jacobi split his compositional work into two different styles or manners of composing. The first highly personal individual style in which he made no compromises. The second, a lighter, more accessible style complying with the general expectations. Such a tendency may be found in other composers as well, but it is particularly evident in Jacobi's case. Both manners may be viewed as influenced by Hindemith. The personal style, which Jacobi viewed as continuing the German tradition of Bach, Brahms, and Hindemith, and the style which we may term following Georg Schirschberg's uh, categorization uh, as popular nationalism. Here, the emphasis is on popular, not in the sense of complying with audience's taste, but in the sense of music for use, including works intended for amateurs. These compositions are still sophisticated, but composed with the listener in mind. They often tend to nationalism, like other compositions of the time, and reveal the composer's attempt to devise a musical language which would be his own, but offer something of a national idiom or a national sound. Jacobi's statement, I was born in a town that doesn't exist anymore, reflects the reality of composers of his generation, whose life story split into two distinct parts, a pre-migration lost world and a new life in which everything was new and the past was to be relinquished. In a sense, he and others experienced a double erasure. Expulsed from Germany as a Jew, Jacobi could not identify as a German. As an Israeli composer, he could not affiliate himself with German culture. His statement was unconsciously echoed 
in his description of the idea leading him to the composition of Mutatio. At the time, he was browsing through a collection of transcriptions from ethnographic recordings to which I will return, picking the ones he found interesting. As he worked them out in counterpoint, he noticed some similarity between what seemed like two essentially different melodies. So now I, I will quote from uh, an interview in which he told about uh, this experience. I had not read the titles because this was not important to me. When I looked over the book, I found that the two melodies had the same title. Now I compared them and I found out that one was an Iraqi melody and the other Kurdistani of the same prayer but the solution was absolutely different. One was a diatonic melody in major and the other a chromatic melody in minor, but the source was the same. And I was fascinated about the thing. Suddenly, I had the idea that these two melodies are based on a melody that doesn't exist anymore, but I had to find it. And I started my composition with a chorale prelude establishing this unknown melody. That was almost a musicological subject. Jacobi began composition in what he termed a musicological project, but was in effect the imagining of the long lost tune, which he viewed as an ancient one, uh, as a common source of the two different offshoots. So this is the point uh, where it's necessary to move to the other story, the second story, that of Mutatio's sources, which is not as simple as Jacobi envisioned. In tracing the original transcriptions and the original ethnographic recordings, a chain of transmission is revealed through which the original piyut was transformed into the symphonic piece. The process took place over more than two decades and involved several stages and different people. So how did the melodies reach Jacobi? This diagram shows uh, the different stages. The original recordings was made by, uh, were made by American musicologist, a Holocaust survivor, Johanna Spector, who, found, who spent the years 19, 51 to 1953 as a research fellow in Israel, collecting the music of various Jewish traditions. Spector began her fellowship at a crucial time. Between 1950 and 1952, almost the entire Jewish communities of Iraq and Kurdistan migrated to Israel. Uh, so I'm going to play the original recordings that she made. Uh, assuming that the two cantors were among the newcomers, which is very likely, the recordings were probably made uh, shortly after their arrival. So the first is the, what uh, Kobe called the Baghdad version by Babu uh, Khabdal uh, Ezra, their names, recorded in 1951. And then I'll play the second one. Sorry. Amtahan al-Baliha Lakhshabim Uffahad al-Baliha Nasabim Yibrim Adil Faru Laddim ki version is the one that Jacobi referred to as the Kurdistan version, sung by Ezra Mordechai of Somania. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh. 
Over a decade later, the recordings became part of the holdings of the new National Sound Archive, where they were discovered by Jacobi's colleague and friend, the Berlin-born composer Chaim Alexander. Alexander was employed at the archive and became involved in a pu publication project initiated by several institutions in the early 1970s, including the Israel Composers Fund, the Israel Music Institute, the Israel Sound Archive, and the Ministry of Education. Um, and it was called the Educational Music Series, which was part of the general effort to lay the foundation for a new musical culture through the synthesis of Jewish folk music and Western art music. Its declared goal was to promote the composition of easy pedagogical instrumental and vocal works for students based, based on ethnographic materials from the collections of the recently founded uh, archive. The resulting publications would be uh, offered to music students and teachers. Alexander compiled a collection of approximately 200 transcriptions, most of them Sephardic, Middle Eastern, and North African Jewish origins, selecting the ones he judged uh, suitable while, uh, quote, taking into consideration uh, pedagogical aspects. The compilation was then sent to several composers, including Jacobi. Alexander, uh, I will speak a little bit about his uh, special methods. Uh, he stressed that uh, his purposes and methods were not musicological nor scholarly. And the project is itself primarily aimed at achieving practical goals. That is producing material for arrangement rather than the conservation of melodies for research purposes. So he says, uh, for the musicologist, the project was and is a profanation of scientific materials, no matter what purpose it pursued. Whereas for the composers, there is only the goal of making this heritage accessible to young students in the most appropriate form. According to these goals, Alexander developed his practical notation. For example, in notating a meter-free recitative melody, he suggested the use of uh, defined yet asymmetrical measure units. Um, so, uh, at times he produced, uh, yeah, he, he used, he, had, he made uh, two transcriptions of the same melody. Um, so in addition to the, to the primary transcription here, uh, he produced a second textless transcription labeled as suggestion for functional arrangement. Such items contain measure lines, tempo markings, occasional formal analysis, and suggestions for instrumental arrangement. For example, the Kurdistan Piyut that we see here um, is preceded by uh, the following note uh, with uh, some suggestions for uh, ensembles for instrumental uh, arrangements. And the following is the uh, version of the Baghdad version. The Kurdistan version and the Baghdad version are both uh, uh, the two melodies that Jacobi referred to. Alexander's explanations about his methods of practical arrangement are helpful in under understanding his transcribing method. In general, his approach to transcription was not just practical, but also reflecting a specific performance at a specific time. In this, he differed from other musicologists, such as Amnon Shiloh, which is, uh, this is uh, uh, Amnon Shiloh's transcription of the same piyut. And uh, we have another example. So these examples are available uh, online uh, in the handout. Uh, and you can see the link in the chat. Uh, this is the transcription by Idelson of the same piyut, slightly different version. Uh, we will not have time to go into the, uh, these transcriptions, but um, 
these examples are general, they generally portray uh, a different approach. They portray a skeletal tune or a simplified model, which is used as a basis for realization in performance. Unlike them, Alexander notated uh, the music, sorry, Alexander notated uh, the melodic and rhythmical aspects of a specific performance as, as closely as possible, thus fixing it into a state of permanence, rendering it them um, text. Jacobi accepted the transcriptions as fa at face value, as representing two different melodies. Subsequently, he attributed the similarities between the melodies to a common source, uh, which is the melody that doesn't exist anymore, the origin of mutatio. Uh, so these are the three uh, melodies that are the basis of mutatio. And uh, I will play them all uh, in a minute. Uh, in comparing Alexander's transcriptions with Jacobi's imagined one, his own version, uh, we get some idea as of the aspects that arose his interest, as well as his notion of the ancient source. So uh, I'd like to play uh, each of the versions, which are uh, the foundation of the, uh, in the source of mutatio. This is the Baghdad version. on to Jacobi's version, which highlights the chromaticism of the Baghdad version and the modal difference, major versus minor, he attributed to the two versions. It also includes something of the rhythmical irregularity of the Kurdistan version. On the other hand, Jacobi simplified the form of the transcribed melodies, reducing the original structure, which follows the textual pattern of AABA, to a simple AB structure.
Okay, so now we'll turn to Jacobi's use of the three melodies in Mutatio. Though this was not explicitly admitted by Jacobi, the piece shows some resemblance, a very close resemblance, to the first movement of Hindemith's uh, Hindemith's uh, Mat Matis Dermada Symphony, the first movement. In its structure, orchestration, and polyphonic texture, Mutatio displays in Hindemith's influence as a model. Most interestingly, it relates to Hindemith's use of traditional melodies. Uh, in this case, uh, the German chorale, Es Sungen Drei Engel. Uh, in, which is used in the beginning and uh, the end of the movement, serving as introduction and coda. Initially, the choral melody is introduced by the trombone set against a faster moving polyphonic texture. Subsequent statements of the choral retain the prominence of brass and wings. The setting of the verse in this manner clearly alludes to the German tradition of choral setting. The core of the movement, however, is in sonata form with principal, secondary, and closing themes. The chorale melody reappears in the development part at the climax of the movement where the different themes are polyphonically juxtaposed, set against each other, and as sub counter subjects to the chorale melody. This scheme correlates almost exactly with the structure of Jacobi's Mutatio with a piut in, in place of the chorale. Hindemith's influence is further revealed in Jacobi's orchestration of mutatio, in particular in the sounding of verse statement in the trombone and other brass instruments set against polyphonic texture in the orchestra. In following Hindemith's model, mutatio consists of chorale statements uh, that form the introduction and coda, encompassing a sonata section with freely composed themes that are polyphonically juxtaposed against each other and against the traditional melodies in the coda. Like Hindemith, Jacobi points to the German Protestant tradition of choral setting as the source of his composition technique. Thus, in his program notes, Jacobi explicitly referred to the composition as an extended choral prelude. This choice is particularly striking for an Israeli composer. With the Holocaust still fresh in Israeli memory and the controversy surrounding the reparation agreement continuing, Jacobi's work came at a time when the public's rejection of everything German was in its peak. His choice carries an element of resistance, but also of finding his own path towards the merging of his two cultural worlds. In searching for a common source for the two melodies, he was not only seeking their ancient source, but also the joint origin of both Jewish and Christian European cultures. This idea is expressed in Jacobi's program notes to Mutatio. Mutatio is not just looking at the Jewish past. It is looking back also to sources in the history of European polyphonic writing. All Near Easter music is essentially one line music, pure homophony or heterophony. While all European music since about 800 years ago is essentially polyphonic. Israel is geographically and historically the ideal place to combine and unite the two contrasting principles in music. Polyphonic treatment, especially the use of free imitative counterpoint adds new dimensions and depth to the expressive oriental melodic line. In the historiography of Western music, the movement from antiquity to modernity is represented by the evolutionary progression from monophony to polyphony. In Jacobi's Mutatio, this idea is realized through the employment of typically Western procedures, which bring to the four prominent symbols. These include polyphonic techniques suggesting early historical styles of Western music, the overall framework of sonata form, 
and most remarkably, the external appearance of the Choral Prelude. So in the time left, I'd like to um, first bring Jacobi's references to these techniques from the program notes with uh, brief examples, just to have the uh, sound, and then play the relevant parts of the piece, uh, which is the Mutatio as a whole is about nine uh, to 10 minutes long. So it, it, uh, it divides to three sections of approximately three minutes. Okay, so uh, Jacobi wrote, first I search for the basic unknown theme of the medieval prayer as an archetype synthesis of the two different versions in the way a Baroque composer paraphrases in a choral prelude. Afterward, I introduced the Kurdistan version once using stylistic trends of medieval tenor counterpoint and the second time in the soprano oriented arrangement in later imitative style. So he speaks of uh, these three techniques, choral prelude, uh, medieval tenor, and uh, soprano, uh, a bit later, soprano-oriented imitative polyphony uh, from a Renaissance, I suppose. Uh, and I'll play each of the examples. Okay, that was the popular um, texture. Now the medieval tenor underpoint. And the last one, uh, what he calls imitative polyphony. Which I also played at the start. And uh, so now we listen to uh, about three minutes, the, the first part of the piece.
So the next section is another symbol of Western music, sonata form. According to Jacobi, starting the second part is a variation of my own. It is, a construct, uh, it is con constructed like the exposition of a sonata form allegro, developing and contrasting different melodies, melodic and rhythmic motifs of uh, the basic theme and introducing free fugal counterpoint. Instead of development section, appears the Baghdad variation as a middle part in free imitative counterpoint. In the recapitulation, the fugal counterpoint section is used as a counter theme to Fugato. Actually, it's not so, that's, that's the next section, so I'll repeat to, I'll uh, come back to it. Uh, so we look at the uh, sonata part of the piece. Uh, portraying uh, the first, the primary theme with its counter theme, uh, the secondary theme, and finally the Baghdad variation instead of uh, development. The second theme, I, um, I skipped the primary theme, but uh, you'll hear it in the beginning of the, this section when I play the video. Uh, this is the Baghdad variation. I'll play this part of the piece, uh, the beginning of the sonata uh, form section with primary theme, its counter theme, and then the secondary theme we just heard, going to the Baghdad variation.
Great. So uh, the last part is the recapitulation. And this is what uh, Jacobi says, the fugal counterpoint section is used as a counter theme to a fugato based on the Kurdistan version. That's what we have uh, there. Um, a double fugue with a uh, Kurdistan version augmented and the sonata primary theme as a counter subject. subject. That happens uh, toward the end of the recapitulation just before the short coda. Okay, so we'll just listen to this part. used and uh, a concluding part. Um, Mutatio as a whole shows certainly where I stand in relation to Jewish ethnic music, to music of today and to the music of Israel, Jacobi wrote. Clearly he perceived this work as a standing apart from his other compositions, feeling that he had finally found a path that was both Israeli and yet true to his own style and to the tradition from which it stemmed. Jacobi's search for the melody that doesn't exist anymore echoes his situation as an immigrant moving between different cultural worlds. His seeking for the common source was his way to combine his two different identities, the German and the Jewish Israeli one. This resolution came after 40 years in the desert of adjustment, a very long process in his case. Both stories, that of the composer and that of the musical sources, express the reality of movement, displacement, and migration. Those who took part in the process of transmission of the piyut into the piece were all immigrants. The cantors, musicologists, transcriber, and, and composer, all of them were trying to retextualize their traditions, life stories, and identities, to recover what is lost and to merge past and present. 
It is this negotiation which gave birth to Mutatio in the form of a German choral prelude on a Jewish Baghdadi piyut. And thank you for listening. Okay. <clears throat> so Iri, thank you very much for an excellent piece of work. I think it's a wonderful presentation of the state of Israeli music. This is already in the 1970s, but of course it's springing out of his, relay, uh, his life in the 1930s when he had this terrible period, he had a very difficult years in uh, Istanbul where he didn't fit at all. And uh, then the difficult time of adjusting in Jerusalem. And uh, it shows the, in general, the life of the, the Israeli composers, the German reality was very powerful. In fact, most of the early Israelis, let's say, called them founding fathers, came from German background. Well, they could be German. Here we heard about Heinz Alexander and Heinrich Jacobi, uh, Josef Grintal, all of them were Germans. The others were small minority, and uh, of, all of them were immigrants. And that's the way Israeli music came out. And I think that's a wonderful example of how uh, Hanoch Yaakobi is looking for Baghdadi or Kurdistani Jewish piyut, which were so far from his own world in Germany and trying to force them into the choral prelude. I think there is nothing further away from the monophonic Baghdadi piyut than the German choral in the Hindemid style. So let's hear if there is any comment, further comment or question. Do unmute yourself. Uh, Rachel would like to ask a question. Unmute yourself. Great. Thank you for this. This was really fascinating, and I'm actually looking forward to hearing Mutatio in full. Um, you heard it in full. We heard the whole well, piece. Yes, but we heard it all broken up into little chunks, and I want to kind of listen to it in, uninterrupted, as as you know, God and Jacoby intended. Um, but it got me thinking that the, there is this sort of overarching narrative of the creation of Israeli art music that's sort of almost inevitable that it's these German trained composers who are coming to Palestine that would become Israel and they're sort of taking their training in German, you know, European style art music and applying it to Middle Eastern melodies that they found and, you know, Jacoby's he, and, and the people in the Israel Sound Archive are saying, well, you know, there's this difference between European polyphonic music and Oriental, you know, homophonic and heterophonic music. And we're going to take these um, Middle Eastern melodies and use them as sources and hang these European decorations on them, essentially. And what I'm wondering is, is there, I mean, is there anyone who's doing the opposite? Is there anyone who's saying, well, Europe has its melodies too, and Near Eastern musical traditions have their own ways of approaching melodies or melodic fragments. Is there a way that we can, instead of Europeanizing a Baghdadi piyut melody, maybe uh, Iraqi eyes or Kurdistan eyes, something like Maut Tsur or a European melody? That, that does, it, does it go the other way too? Or is this just sort of, this one-sided way of looking at Israeli art music? Well, I don't think, there are, it's not that we have two poles 
There is the art music, which was completely European. Mm-hmm. After all, it was not only Hanoch Yaakobi, or it was also the Palestine Orchestra, founded in 1936 by Huberman and became the Israel Philharmonic to this day, which is a very powerful, excellent orchestra in the European Western style. There was nothing similar to that. Mm-hmm. I think today, nowadays, situation is very different because the Piyut tradition, for example, is extremely powerful in Israel now. Mm-hmm. The people hear even entire evenings of Piyut and it's very popular and the Paitanim are very popular, but this is a new development. Now we have new things happening. For example, Arabic musicians who became Israeli, they are part of Israeli music. But when you talk about the history in the 1940s, 50s, the situation was that the German culture was very powerful. The string quartets, piano music, the academies of music, where I studied, for example, in the Academy of Tel Aviv in the 1950s, where the language you heard from the teachers were you know, either German, part of spoke mostly German, the others spoke Hungarian, and uh, that this was the tradition they lived in. And uh, the, is, well, the so-called Israeli music did not exist yet. Mm-hmm. The source was what we heard. After all, when we hear Mutazio, when I first heard it, when I got it from Irit, I didn't know about the Pio team. It sounded to me like a German piece by Hindemith. And uh, it's a real like revelation the- to hear the Pio mm-hmm. inside that. Mm-hmm. That is, I think uh, when we talk of, of art music, we, it's, we talk of institutions. It's very institutionalized. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so this, this is the music that was institutionalized. It was supported by, by the state. And this is very obvious in the case of the Piyut and how it got to Jacobi, who never even sought it. It just uh, came to him. Um, so it was a whole system of producing uh, works like this, uh, rather than the other way around, of course. That's, that, that, that is very interesting. And it's, it sounds like it might be kind of a fun thing to do to see ways in which this new interest in Piyut could be incorporated into more established Israeli um, music institutions, because that, that could probably produce some wonderful new composition. The Piyut is very much alive. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think, in a way, it's it's more alive than uh, than Jacobi's piece, mm-hmm. since it is uh, sung and and used. Yeah, and the tradition is alive, and the youth is uh, is being uh, revived these days. You know, there's uh, the whole movement. This could be the start of a beautiful revived. friendship. Yeah, I think that Agnes Corey had a question. Please. Can Agnes? you hear me? Yeah, now yeah. we do. Yes. Okay, brilliant. Um, uh, it, thank you very, very much. I very much enjoyed your presentation. To my taste, that was the perfect presentation. So grateful, thanks. Um, I've got three questions, quite easy um, and quite ignorant. Number one, the two gentlemen from uh, Baghdad and Kurdistan, who sung the source material. Did they sing in Arabic or in Hebrew? In That's Hebrew. question one. Was it Hebrew? Yes. yes. So even if they come from Arabic countries, they sing in Hebrew? Yes, it is. Uh, uh, the beauty itself is very old. It's uh, probably from the 13th century. And he and most likely came from uh, uh, you know from the land of Israel 
to other places and had different musical versions. Okay. Anyhow, the chorus was held in Hebrew. That's what unified the a Jewish prayer that they were the sung in Hebrew, not in Arabic. Okay, the second question is very, very easy. Who was this absolutely, utterly brilliant violinist who played your examples? What? I'm sorry. Uh, who, who was this very, very, very good violinist? Oh, <laughs> the played... violinist is my is my husband, of course. <laughs> because it is astonishingly wonderful. I really, oh, thank really, you. I really uh, appreciated yeah. all, all, all his expressive intonation and everything else, but that's another story. Now the third thank one, the, the, the third question, um, you mentioned Hindemith during your presentation and also that uh, Jakob went to Tur Turkey uh, before he went to Palestine and it didn't work out too well for him. So I'm wondering whether his attempt in Turkey had anything to do with Hindemit, because Hindemit was a very powerful man in Turkish musical life and he wasn't very nice and he did prevent a few excellent musicians from going there. Yes, yes, uh, that's interesting, very interesting question. And it's uh, yes, yes and no. He, the, the fact that he went to Istanbul is very much related to Hindemith. Hindemith is the one who made uh, the connection. Uh, but this was before Hindemith got the offer to become involved in the Ankara Conservatory. So that was about a year before. They, uh, it, it never, um, it, the, it was never uh, at, at the same time. So by the time that uh, Jacobi was already in Palestine, uh, uh, Hindemith came to Turkey. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you again. Brilliant. I'm very enthusiastic. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Is there any other question or comment? Malcolm Miller? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, again, a wonderful presentation. Um, yeah, I was very interested in about the performance history of the piece. Is it um, something which is performed, you know, regularly recently? Has it been recorded? And um, in in doing so, I, I mean, one of the questions on performance would be the extent to which audiences um, would recognize and uh, Take on board the the those particular piety, the tunes, the themes, as as perhaps a Bach chorale might be recognised by so the Western audience for for its various symbolism. Originally, that's actually interesting. Uh, Jacobi composed it when he spent a year as a guest artist at the Technion. Um, where there was a, an amateur orchestra. And so he composed it for the exact uh, ensemble that he had there. Uh, but later he arranged it to a symphonic uh, orchestra. And uh, the, what we heard is uh, very bad quality, but it's the uh, Philharmonic playing. So it's, it's a very good performance. Um, and it, 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 ha it had been played uh, several times, but uh, I think it's pretty much forgotten the piece right now. Uh, we, we don't get to hear it a lot. Uh, it's an interesting question to ask whether people would recognize. I'm, I'm sure, yes, people would recognize if they know the, the piute. And uh, the, these things should somehow meet to get together. Uh, the piute singing and, and this piece. Thanks. Yes, I was just wondering how, to what extent, sort of orchestras know about it, you know, around the world, and um, whether it's, it was, uh, you know, probably, I don't think it's, it's known. You've, or, you've, you've, yeah. It's a, yeah, well, it's very great that you've sort of uh, brought it to our attention that, that it, should, it should get more. Thank you. Better yeah. known. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Very hardly performed now. I think it's we have to do something to.
to promote his music more, but uh, he always felt sort of forgotten. And uh, I knew him a little, and he was not always very happy. He felt sort of on the side road a bit. I just um, was thinking in terms of the Hindemith connection that it's similar to in, from the 1950s that, that he's, you said he started he, the recordings that came from the 1950s of the, of the source material. But in the 1950s, uh, uh, Franz Reisenstein, who emigrated from, from Germany and was a pupil of Hindemith, came to, the, to Britain and wrote a lot of or some orchestral works. And there's, there's something sort of in the, that sort of love of counterpoint, you know, quite rich counterpoint, richly orchestrated, which seems to go into that piece, even though the piece is obviously written much later. But there, there, there seem to be some sort of maybe connections there in, in terms of the Hindemithian element. Yeah, Kobe spoke a lot about his uh, studies with Hindemith. It's very interesting because he was uh, maybe his first, uh, among his first or even his first uh, student, they came to the academy at the same time. Joseph Ness. Uh, are his scores available? Uh, the score, yes, yes, it's available to the Israel, uh, Israel Music Institute. Yes. Yeah. And are the parts yeah. available? Are there parts or just the yes, score? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. It's available through the publication, yes. Anybody else want to ask, say something? Or? Well, obviously a very... Um, stimulating and and wonderful presentation bringing to our attention something that we might not have been aware of or we might completely ignore and hopefully this will mean that these things come to um, the surface and are performed again I mean we started the the um, international forum for suppressed music and maybe you should get onto that forum because there they are dealing with so many composers who totally were out of their milieu, out of their, their position where they were appreciated, were not able to talk in the same way to the new audiences where they lived. And it was a really serious uh, proposition. So I'll send you the details of how to connect up with other people who are dealing with Toch and Krenek and Strecker and all these composers who um, moved out of their comfort zone, you know, and some of them never composed again, uh, you know, really suffered terribly from that. So thank you for bringing this up and for looking after him and, and caring for him <laughs> and showing us the music. Um, thank you, thank you. I'm really also pleased to see Isabel Gantz. So Isabel, tell us about your ordeal. Isabel, as you know, couldn't uh, communicate last week because she was stuck in frozen Texas. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was my biggest disappointment. Um, I slept uh, wearing a fur hat and gloves and seven layers of blankets and three cats. Um, Right now I'm dealing with survivor's guilt because so many of my friends had burst pipes and their ceilings fell down, completely collapsing into their apartments or their homes. So I feel very blessed and very lucky. A really terrible. Good to see you here with us. Yeah, thank you. It's good to be here. And that was a wonderful presentation from both of you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's good to have you back with us. So we were just looking at the situation of what we do when we come last year, when we started, we went right through August, July and August. Now, this year, we booked up to the middle of July. And now I'd just like to know from you, particularly as there are many regulars with us now, what you feel we should do? Should we take a break in August? Are people going to go away or can they connect uh -huh. from where they are? Or what are we going to do about the high holidays, which all take place on Tuesdays in September? 
what do you want to do? Do you want to meet on another day to have another kind of discussion? So who would like to start off telling me what you think you'd like to do? I think it will be better to take a break because people go away and especially now they may go away after all these lock-ins and tr troubles. So I think during the high holidays, it's better to take it, about two or three weeks of break. Otherwise there will be, we won't get many people to participate and that is shame. Any, any other views? I'd like to suggest for the high holidays, why don't we have our own minyan? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think we want to hold a minyan and that's it. Uh, you see, today we had turned more than 30 participants, so we should continue this way. We could I mean, have a session devoted to the shofar. I do think I, I, I do think that a, a, at least a little break over the high holidays would be nice because if if shuls are having Zoom high holidays, it's going to be much easier to get completely oiska zoomed, and <laughs> you know, and and then it would be a little bit special to come back and say, okay, the high holidays are past, and now we can all reconvene and tell each other how we, how everything went, and sort of have a have a new reconvening. Mm. Yeah, the, I was thinking of taking the whole of September off, uh, and maybe, but also maybe the latter half of August as well. Do you think we can sustain a six-week break? I'm oh, sure yeah. we can. 